Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Philip Kangotanda's play, Yankee Dog, You Die. Now, this is a play that's really concerned with um, representation and the power of art to shape people's worldviews. Um, it's, it's a two-person play. Um, we have Vincent Chang and Bradley Yamashita. Um, both of whom are Asian American actors. Vincent is an older actor. Bradley is a younger emerging actor. And their relationship is somewhat tense. Um, Vincent is kind of the established, at times he almost seems like an old style diva. Um, Bradley is the emerging actor who has sort of been raised on the legacy of Vincent as a as an older, more established Asian American performer, and yet there is a tremendous amount of tension here. Um, the key the key tension is really over the types of roles that Vincent became famous for playing. Um, and we, we get one of these actually in um, what's called Interlude 1. So the play opens with an introduction, which is very short, um, basically just sort of setting up. It's a, it's a meta-theatrical opening that sets up and introduces Vincent and Bradley um, and then announces the title of the play. But then we go to this interlude um, and it says, lights come up, Vincent, who I believe is, if I'm not mistaken, Vincent is Chinese American, not Japanese American. Vincent portraying a Jap soldier. Uh, lighting creates the mood of an old 40s black and white movie. Thick Coke bottle glasses holding a gun acts in an exaggerated, stereotypic, almost cartoonish manner. Sergeant Moto pretends to be falling asleep while guarding American prisoners. The snake-like lids of his slanty eyes drooping into a feigned slumber. Suddenly, Moto's eyes spitting hate and bile flash open, catching the American prisoners in the midst of their escape plans. So, not fantastic in terms of the, the sort of stage directions here, but Gotenda is specifically doing that because this mirrors the kind of thing that you might see in 1940s and 50s depictions of Japanese soldiers. Um, so, we then get this section where Vincent is speaking as Sergeant Moto, and it is very much this, like, I mean, Gotenda put it exaggerated, stereotypic, almost cartoonish manner. It is exactly that. Um, this is the, like, the character where one of the jokes is that East Asian people, particularly Japanese people, often have difficulty pronouncing R's. Um, so one of the, the, um, one of the jokes, one of the fairly racist jokes in here, uh, is that Moto claims to be a graduate of UCLA class of 34. And, the way he pronounces it, or the way that the American prisoners hear it, is as dirty floor. Hilarious and racist. But again, that was the 40s, 50s, the way that these World War II movies were portrayed. And so that's the kind of character that Vincent became famous for portraying, and much of the conflict between Bradley and Vincent deals with Bradley's resentment at these very racist, stereotypical, uncomplimentary depictions of Asian people, and Vincent defending his legacy as a performer. 
And we get this section that I think really sort of encapsulates this conflict. Um, Bradley is talking about um, the not entirely uncommon tendency of East Asian people, particularly younger East Asian people with money, to try and get plastic surgery to look more white. Um, and, and what Bradley says is, at the end of this tirade, he says, um, where does it begin, Vincent? All this self-hate. Where does it begin? You and your Charlie Chop Suey rolls. And Vincent says, you want to know the truth? I'm glad I did it. Yes, you heard me right. I'm glad I did it, and I'm not ashamed. I wanted to do it. And no one is ever going to get an apology out of me. And in some small way, it is a victory. Yes, a victory. At least an Oriental was on screen acting, being seen. We existed. Bradley says, but that's not existing. So wearing some goddamn monkey suit and kissing up to some white man, that's not existing. And Vincent says, that's all there was, Bradley. That's all there was. But you don't think I would um but you don't think I wouldn't have wanted to play a better role than that buck toothed groveling waiter? I would have killed for a better role where I could have played an honest to God human being with real emotions. I would have killed for it. You seem to assume Asian Americans always existed. That there were always that there were always roles for you. You didn't exist back then, Buster. Better uh, back then, there was no Asian American consciousness, no Asian American actor, and no Asian American theaters. Just a handful of Orientals who, for some godforsaken reason, wanted to perform, act. And we did, at church bazaars, community talent night, and on the chop suey circuit playing Chinatowns and Little Tokyos, all around the country as hoofers, jugglers, acrobats, strippers, anything we could do for anyone who would watch. You, you with your holier-than-thou look trying to make me feel ashamed, you wouldn't be here if it weren't for all the crap we had to put up with. We built something. We built the mountain, as small as it may be, and that you stand on so proudly looking down at me. Sure, it's a mountain of Charlie chopped sueys and slipper-toting geishas, but it's also filled with forgotten moments <clears throat> Sorry. of extraordinary wonder, artistic achievement. A singer, Larry Ching, he could croon like Frank Sinatra and better looking too. Ever heard of him? Toyette Mar, boy, she could belt it out with the best of them. Chinese Sophie Tucker, no one's ever heard of her. And Dorothy Takahashi, she could dance with high he the high heels off anyone, Ginger Rogers included. And who in the hell has ever heard of Fred Astaire and Dorothy Takahashi? Dead dreams, my friend. Dead dreams, broken backs, and long-forgotten beauty. I swear sometimes when I'm taking my curtain call, I can see this shadowy figure out of the corner of my eye taking the most glorious, dignified bow. Who remembers? Who appreciates? And Bradley says, See, you think every time you do one of those demeaning roles, the only thing lost is your dignity. That the only person who has to pay is you. Don't you see that every time you do that, you do that, millions of people in movie theaters will see it, believe it, Every time you do any old stereotypical role just to pay the bills, someone has to pay for it. And it ain't you. No, it's some Asian kid innocently walking home. Hey, it's a Chinaman... G-word. Rambo, Rambo, Rambo. You older actors. You ask to be understood, forgiven, but you refuse to change. You have no sense of social responsibility. So I think this is really the, the sort of core element of this debate is and it's a it's a very important debate in terms of representation and possibilities for actors of color in particular in in western productions in the US in Europe etc cetera, etc cetera. um The sort of challenging questions that the play asks are really, really important because we do have the same kinds of issues with African Americans on stage, with Hispanics on stage, with um, indigenous Americans on stage, etc., etc. When the only roles that exist for people in a particular demographic are negative racist portrayals 
is it ethically right to take those parts so that at least someone of your demographic is seen on on screen, on stage, on TV, whatever it is, or because those parts build these negative images, negative portrayals of your demographic, and they're, thereby, in some ways, can contribute to ongoing racism, ongoing um, negative cultural images of, of people in your demographic, is it an unethical thing to do? Is it, is it, is it something, is the cost of buying that representation worth the price of reinforcing or recreating negative stereotypes throughout society at large. I, I mean, I don't have an answer to this. I, this is clearly not a question that I, I mean, despite being half Jewish, this is not a question that I have any sort of real uh, standing to, to address. Um, but it is something that I think remains an ongoing concern for actors of color, artists of color, um, even writers of color. If what mainstream society, and by mainstream society here, I largely mean the white controlled mass media, uh, white controlled film industry, white controlled music industry, etc., etc., if what they expect is racist performances, do you give them racist performances so that someone who is Asian, who is African American, who is Hispanic, whatever it is, can be seen? That's the deep and pressing sort of question of Gratanda's play. And there isn't ultimately a clear answer to it in the play. I don't think Gatanda has an answer to it. I think it's, I think what he wants is to promote the negotiation, the discussion of this issue. <laughs>